Good day. I'm happy to be here to talk about patient-centered clinical care for African Americans. So why is that important? Why is um, giving patient-centered clinical care to African Americans relevant? Well, it's for a number of good reasons. There are demographic reasons, there are the clinical outcomes and the significant health disparities that we see. Um, we have um, the historical basis for, for bias and trust issues that people have. And there are some important um, clinical care differences that uh, providers need to be aware of that will result in uh, improved outcomes. So let's start by looking at the demographics. Uh, nationally, um, we hear in that, that blue pie square there uh, is that, um, um, that African Americans make up 13% of the population. And so incidentally, in, in the state of Ohio, African Americans also make up 13% of the population. But that 13% um, is a little deceptive, and I'll, I'll show you why. In um, Cleveland, for example, where I'm based, uh, the population is over, just over 50% African American, and you can see 34% white, 10% Hispanic, Latino. In the county, Cuyahoga County, uh, African Americans make up just about 30% of the population. In Columbus, they make up 28%. In Toledo, 27%. In Cincinnati, it's 43%. In Dayton, it's almost 40%. Akron has a 30% African-American population. And Youngstown has 43%. So if you look at the state of Ohio, and this is a neat map that's done by um, the Census Bureau, you'll see, and it sort of shows the population, uh, the darker the area, the higher the population, you'll see the African-American population in the state of Ohio tends to be in the urban areas, in all the major cities. And so where are the hospitals? The hospitals also tend to be in the major cities. So the, the increased hospital beds, you know, there are some smaller hospitals in rural areas, but the, the, the majority of the hospitals are also in the major cities. And so as a provider, if you are based in a major city, you're going to see a much higher percentage of African Americans in your practice than a 13% would imply, right? And so if you're in a rural area, you may not see any one or two every now and then. But if you're in a in an urban area, you're going to see 30 percent, 40 percent, maybe even half of your patient practice will be African-Americans. And that's because of the increased um, chronic diseases in African-Americans. So if you're in a dialysis center, you're going to see a majority uh, African-American. If you're working in a nephrology office, you're going to see a majority African-American in, in a lot of these major cities because of the disproportionate increase in disease and also because of the population density in the urban areas. So if you look at the U.S. Census for uh, 2010, you'll see where African-Americans, and this just shows an increase in population for African-Americans. And so you'll see that, again, it's also uh, based uh, in the eastern areas, the major cities, um, and in, in the south. So let's look at some clinical outcomes and disparities, right? And so this is a um, uh, sort of a thought activity for you to kind of take a look at these and say, okay, now there are four um, people there with ages with life expectancy beneath them. Uh, one's 74.8, one is 78.5, one's 81.8, and one's 86.5. And then we have those four groups, African Americans, Asian Pacific Islanders, uh, white Americans, and Hispanic Latinos. So um, what I'd like you to do is um, sort of assign each of those to the ages that are aligned there. You know, who's got the lowest life expectancy? Who has the highest life expectancy? And so since I'm giving this talk, I'll spot you that the African Americans have the lowest life expectancy with the 74.8. So, um, and I think that comes as no surprise given all the, um, the, the, the publicity that's been out there about health disparities. But, but who, are, who are the next three? Who's 78.5 and who's 81.8 and who's 86.5? Give you a second to think, think about that. And here comes the answer. So I was surprised um, years ago when I first saw this that, that, that um, 
a number of things that 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 white Americans were just ahead of, of African Americans just by a few years at 78.5 that Hispanic Latinos actually live overall population wise live longer than white Americans and that Asian Pacific Islanders leave, live significantly longer than whites and um, African Americans so I naively I believed that minorities all had bad outcomes and the majority white Americans had good outcomes but this uh, clearly is um it, well it was a surprise to me I'll, I'll admit my my ignorance and um and I I I, I really bring this up to show you that really when you talk about health disparities and, and poor outcomes African Americans are are alone well almost alone as it relates to this if you add in uh, Native Americans you see that they're at a disadvantage as well at, at 76.9 so if you look at the life expectancy by race overall you can see that African Americans are sort of away from the pack in terms of um, life expectancy from 1970 to uh, 2010 and then um, taking that forward through 2017 and breaking it down according to race you see that African-American males like myself have the lowest life expectancy followed by um, non-Hispanic whites and then uh, African-American females at 78.1 then Hispanic males at 90 I'm sorry 79 and then uh, white females at 81 and then Hispanic females at 84 so if you look at the mortality again broken down by male and female male being in the blue and female being in the um, gray you can see that um, again African Americans have the worst outcomes but what's curious to me is that um, if you look at African American uh, females and follow that across you'll see that African American females don't live as long as Native American men Hispanic Latino men or Asian Pacific Islander men and so um, if you look at the some sort of recent um, vital statistic data coming out in February of 2020 with uh, with predictions about life expectancy uh, changes from due to COVID and um, and the pandemic, you'll see that that everyone is sort of taking a dip in life expectancy, uh, and and that dip sort of similar to the dip we see back in 1918 and 1919 when there was another uh, flu pandemic and so we're going to have another sort of blip unfortunate blip that's going to impact us and we'll see and we've seen that we'll see that across the board because of the significant number of deaths here in the country but when you look at disparities unfortunately you're going to see that if you look that um, Hispanic Latinos overall had a drop in life expectancy from uh, almost 82 to um, almost 80 uh, that whites had a life of, uh, decreased life expectancy from 78 um, to um, 78.8 to 78 and then unfortunately uh, African Americans had a, a significant most significant decrease from 74.7 to 72 if you break it down according to male and female you see that again unfortunately uh, african-american males had a three-year drop in life expectancy uh, due to the pandemic followed by a you know two and a half year drop by hispanic males a little over two for hispanic females um sorry, sorry for um, african-american females a little over two um, just over one for hispanic females a little under one for um, white males and um, a little under um, 0.7 for uh, white females so the, the health disparities are, are, are getting worse uh, as we've been, been highlighted by the um, pandemic uh, data and uh, we're losing ground so if you look at the life expectancy again comparing uh, african-american female you see african-american males have the absolute worst across countries but if you look again at african-american females and i was raised to believe that women live longer than men right uh, you'll see that African American females still don't live as long as the men in Switzerland and France and the United Kingdom so there are things that contribute to the disadvantage uh, in life expectancy for African Americans and um, some the number one is heart disease and then there's cancer and homicide and diabetes and then uh, infant mortality perinatal issues all contribute to the disadvantage um that in, in life expectancy and so african americans have the worst cardiovascular outcomes and you see it right there 321 per hundred thousand that's significantly higher than what's in second place 
So you really have to be aware of the cardiovascular disadvantage. If you look at diabetes, again, African Americans are at the, have the highest, but much closer to the pack uh, uh, to uh, Native Americans and uh, Hispanic Latinos. And in terms of cancer, they have the absolute worst outcomes for all the cancers listed there, lung, breast, ovarian, colon, prostate. And so again, it's not all uh, cancers, uh, but if you were gonna list five cancers off the top of your head, odds are the five you'd list, African-Americans would be the absolute worst on that. And so looking at the top cancers, uh, lung, colon, breast, pancreas and prostate again African Americans have the highest and it just shows, it kind of shows the rate if you look at lung cancer and we see the big black bar is lung cancer that's why we spend so much time talking about smoking cessation and, and nicotine and things of that nature but um, significant burden in the white population but just a little bit higher in the African American population and so um, that's uh, if you look at the second bar colon cancer and sort of look at that blue bar across you see African Americans significantly higher breast cancer again and the, uh, we'll touch on briefly later but the incidence of breast cancer is higher in white women but the mortality is significantly higher in black women and you see that that significant difference here in that third bar there and then looking at um, pancreatic cancer it's less but it's unfortunately higher in African Americans and then again that last bar prostate cancer significantly that gray bar significantly higher in um, African Americans so what's driving health disparities? And of course, this that's like sort of the multi-million dollar question, right? What what really is the cause? So if we, we were gonna spend money, what would we do? Um, sort of access and, and, and insurance, you know, quality of insurance has always been uh, a factor that people sort of attributed to things. There are some genetic and epigenetic differences that put uh, some increased burden in these disparities. Uh, there are patient related things as it relates to smoking and diet and exercise and obesity. Um, there are provider and healthcare related, healthcare system related issues in terms of um, our uh, the trust and things that we can impact. And then there's also this, this thing about oppression, oppression or racism and we know that 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 there's discussions that that just being oppressed and they, you know this reaches back to even when they do uh they did studies on rats right when they would they would stress them and the rats would have um, increased um, heart disease or you know earlier um, death and so the, the we're at the point now that that, that the constant oppression and, and racism um, can cause increased inflammation and that inflammation can cause premature heart disease it can it can impact your immune um, response and then there that's why cancers kind of can, can kind of come out because of the impaired immunity uh, the impaired immunity related to um, catching infections right so it's the, there's there's whole um, a lot of research in, in terms of how oppression um, can really Im impact that and they think that even in with infant mortality like the the stress uh, um, that, that, that African-American women have um, in America can cause that, that, that stress is really what's at the bottom of, of the increased infant mortality because it, it surpasses even my socioeconomic status. So if we look at medication non-adherence, um, we find that a, a study that looked at the you know, Jackson Heart Study looked at non-adherence in African-Americans and we saw that 70% of the participants um, had some degree of non-adherence, either intentional or non-intentional. And so um, Marie Brown did a study that said, you know, if we could just improve medication adherence, um, we, we would have a huge impact on, on the quality of health of everyone, not just African-Americans. And so they found that the issues that really contribute to um, issues with uh, poor adherence are related to really understanding what the medication is for. Why am I taking this medication? Um, access, you know, we find, I find that they're always changing uh, the preferred long acting insulin. <laughs> so like in January, it's one thing and in February, it's another thing. And then so in the meantime, the patient's blood sugars are out of control while they're trying to get access to 
whatever their insurance company's preferred long acting insulin is or or you know this so issues with access of medications and then there's also issues with trust in their providers or in the healthcare systems. I mean, I have patients that say, I don't like this healthcare system compared to the other for whatever reason. And so those are also dynamic. So we find that she looked at the, the cost of, 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 of taking your medication, right? So we all, as providers, we know we kind of get notified by the insurance company that says, you know, the patients aren't taking their medication according to how it's prescribed, right? Uh, and I'll ask my patients to bring in bring in their bottles uh, so we can look at them. And I, I'm, I look at the date. When did you get it filled? So you take this medicine every day? Yes, every day. Well, well, here it is, April, and this was filled in December, and you still have 15 tablets left. So I'm not calling you a liar, but, um, you know, where are the rest of the pills? And well, they say, well, I transferred from one bottle to another, but... Either way, there's there's significant um, issues. So, but if if someone had gotten the prescription filled every month, they would have found that that there's increased costs to the insurance company or even to the patient in terms of a copay for you know actually being adherent to the to the medication, right? But that increased cost just pales compared to um, the healthcare related costs from not being adherent to the medication. And so this slide just shows, you know, in terms of the blue with heart failure, you know, there's increased costs with taking your medicine, but look at the cost for not taking it, right? The, um, the uh, C, uh, I'm sorry, CHF exacerbations and coming in the hospital and all those things. And then the hypertension related to strokes and aneurysms and things related to that. And then the diabetes uh, related to infections and circulation issues and amputations. And so if we could just have uh, patients take their medicines, that the significant, the savings would be phenomenal. And so how do you achieve uh, trust? Um, well, the issue is um, it's 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 she again uh, put this um, sort of um, four square up that said you know so you you can you should have to show competence you know and so if if you show the patient that you're competent, they then respect you as a, as a provider right and then if you have to show that you care about them and so increased affection associated so if you have both their respect and their affection, you reach this nirvana where they actually trust you. And with the trust is where you can get some degree of increased adherence with medications, with referrals, with recommendations, with diet recommendations, a whole number of things. So, but looking at trust, uh, Dr. Halbert published in JAMA in, in 2006, um, found that in a study of 1,000 African Americans compared to white, uh, uh, 500 whites, um, African Americans are just more likely to report low trust in healthcare providers. And so that's, and it was 44%. So that's like almost half. And so I was surprised to, to see that. But then when I thought about it, I could see in my practice where this was this was sort of true. And, and it's been a number of times where I've walked into a room with a brand new patient and the patient's looking at me like, you know, they're they're not happy with me. And I'm thinking, what I, I what have I done? I haven't even met you. Am I late or is it, you know, what what is going on? And um I, in the old days, would sort of get an attitude back. I haven't even met you and you're mad at me and that this doesn't seem fair. So we would get off sort of to a bad start. Um, and, and it was because I was unaware that, oh, you're in the 44% that don't trust provide, whether you're black or white or green. I just don't like providers, people, you know, they're, they're from their perspective. And you have to spend a little bit more time early on schmoozing the patient, sort of kind of getting some history, uh, making yourself real, you know, where'd you go to high school, where'd you grow up, um, and then sort of finding some common ground. And then I'll f frequently see that frown sort of break down very early, but but they, they come in with their guard up, not trusting anyone, long, especially if you're a healthcare provider. And that's a significant issue. And so in addition to this, um, Dr. Bolwell did a study that looked 
at the same thing. It's confirmed again, de increased uh, distrust in African-American patients, but also found those elevated concerns about personal privacy and the potential for harmful experimentation. So where does, where does that come from, uh, harmful experimentation? Well, there's a historical basis that, that many of you are aware of and some of you may not be. Well, the Tuskegee syphilis study is probably the the classic, and I, you know I can't give this talk on on without spending a little bit of time talking about the details of it. And so, if you you know the details, sort of forgive me, but I find it frequently people who know the details have, get some aspects of it incorrect. But the study started in 1932, it ran to 72, and it was uh, you know it was a perfectly reasonable, balanced um, study. It had uh, 600 men, almost 400 with syphilis, 200 without. Um, no one was given syphilis, uh, so I, that's a f something I frequently hear that they were injected with said That's not true. The men had syphilis. It was just a matter of, of treating them, and there was no treatment in 1932. It was particularly targeted toward African Americans, toward colored people, and and also it was significant, but it was run by the, the, the U.S. government. It was run by the county health department. And you see the sign government doctor. So they were really trying to say this is a valid, um, upstanding sort of study. And the study was perfectly reasonable until 1942 when penicillin, the cure for syphilis, was released. And some person, someone who we don't know, thank goodness, um, made the conscious decision that, oh no, we won't, we won't stop this study and and treat all these men that have this disease. We will go out of our way to not treat them because we want to see how we want to see what the natural progression of syphilis is. We want to see how things turn out. We we, we want to track what 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 organ failures, what diseases, what things happen, and we're doing a study. And we don't want that really messed up by the fact um, that there's now a cure for the disease that we're studying. And so that went on until 1972, another 30 years where they continued to withhold treatment to these men. Now, here are the things about personal privacy. In order to have the members that were in the study accidentally not treated, they had to communicate with all the doctors and hospitals and, and area emergency rooms and let them know who was in the study so that if they got there, diagnosed them with syphilis, they wouldn't accidentally treat them and mess up the study. And so they had to know the wives and the children so that if they saw the wives or children, they could treat them, right? And also not tell them what they had as well, right? So. They would get a treatment for syphilis, not being told they had syphilis, and then the men would again not get treated for syphilis and also still not know that they had syphilis. So really a significant conspiracy. And when people would come in, just imagine if you just went into a new doctor in a different county, you would still, they'd still know, oh yeah, this is this is so and so. They've got syphilis. Let's treat the wife. We won't treat the husband. Just a, just a, just a terrible. And so all the victims, all African Americans, uh, they all, um, you know, bad outcomes. 30 wives contracted the disease, and 19 children born with congenital syphilis unnecessarily. And so you say, okay, that ended in 1972. You know, is that is that is who who still remembers that? Well, there was a study done by Johns Hopkins that showed that 81 percent of African Americans were aware of the study and its outcome compared to 28% um, of, of, of white Americans that knew anything about the study. Switching gears to uh, the father of uh, gynecology and obstetrics, J. Marion Sims, um, created the Sims Speculum and a number of surgical techniques that have had a significantly positive impact on um, gynecological surgery, but unfortunately, he perfected those surgeries on unanesthetized um, black slaves. And so this has kind of come out over the last few years that, um, you know, his his history, his, um, his, his legacy, um, you know, sort of has been, not sort of, has been tarnished by the fact that, that the, the, he basically made his name 
by experimenting on on unanesthetized black slaves. I mean, which is and and he was a he was a significant scientist. He was um, impeccable in his documentation. So he you can you can you can read about the specific person he did this he did the surgery on how many times what technique he did over and over again. Uh, so there's no issue that he he didn't that he did this. Um, the issue, it, of course, it was not an illegal at the time, but it was certainly immoral. I've never wondered, but I probably should have, um, you know, in the old days in medical school, how, where did they get cadavers from? Where did they get cadavers for anatomy class? You know, we didn't have people donating their bodies to science uh, like they do now. And so we find now that there's a dark history of of grave robbing uh, in, 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 the, in the South and in the East and where best to go and rob a grave is in a, a poor or a black um, cemetery where, I mean, the police are less apt to prosecute you uh, because of that. And so we see uh, numerous examples of this in history. In Baltimore graves, um, other city graves and southern hospitals you'll see more and more and so they find bodies in the basements of, of, of um, colleges and when they uh, build tear down an old building and build a new building they'd find these bodies they knew were cadavers and and they'd see this and then and frequently these were uh, african-american bodies and so I felt like this was an interesting with Georgia Medical College um, where they had Grandison Harris, who was a, initially he was a slave and then later freed and had a, a, a long undistinguished career as a grave robber. And so who better to sneak into an African-American cemetery than uh, an African-American uh, in the night and they said he was amazing in the, uh, the number of, of bodies he was able to get such that he warranted, um, um, you know, he warranted being in the graduation pictures because he significantly contribute, contributed to their um, education. And more recently, uh, in the late 1960s, um, the, there was a man, a 53-year-old man who fell off of a three-foot wall, a three-foot wall, I think about that yardstick three foot wall hit his head was unconscious went to the hospital and within 24 hours um, they had harvested and transplanted his heart into someone else and so again you you, you if you've worked in the hospital having declaring someone dead in 24 hours is is when when their heart is beating and such is a significant thing they did not get permission from his family they didn't get they didn't follow any um, procedures and so now this is all uh, the um, this topic of of, um, of of news reports and so medical science in the u.s is dependent on poor and black bodies so the american medical association also has a tarnished history um, for the things that they've done and in, in 2008 um, they uh, issued a formal apology for their racist actions in the in the past. They discriminated against minority physicians, African American, Hispanic, Latino, Asian physicians who, you know, essentially couldn't couldn't get privileges in hospitals. Were not allowed to 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 do a number of things that white physicians could do, and it was all driven by the American Medical Association. And so um, I, for example, was born at a, at a black hospital in Cleveland called Forest City Hospital because my mother had a, a black obstetrician and he couldn't go to the major hospitals um, here in Cleveland because he couldn't get admit, admitting uh, privileges. And so that was the case all across the country. So even back in February of this year, the uh, CEO of the American Medical Association said that they are still trying to come to terms with, with their own history of racism. Switching to more of the social determinants of health, um, redlining, you know, identifying neighborhoods for disenfranchisement is a significant, uh, significant um, experience uh, in, in many urban areas. And so 
when they redline, you can't invest in them. You can't get a loan on your house. You can't get a loan to open a business. You, it's just a disenfranchised area. And so whenever there's disenfranchisement, there's also enfranchisement, right? And so in the areas that weren't redlined, you can you could refinance your house, you can get a loan to open a business, you could do any number of things that, that they couldn't do in those areas. And those redlined areas are what became, you know, areas of of, of poverty. And so uh, it's a sordid history, but it does provide a sort of a context for why we have some of the slums and poor areas that we have. And so it's important to know that when you put these things in place, undoing it is, is, is certainly not going to be, you're going to have to be as deliberate undoing it as you were in doing it. And so many times these these um, policies were based on public health issues where they would said, you know, in this, for example, it says blacks should be quarantined in isolated slums in order to reduce the instance of civil disturbance, prevent the spread of communicable diseases to the nearby white neighborhoods. So this was not something that was done in secret. This was done. This was done openly. And in a number of cities. So that redlining then leads to disenfranchisement, housing decline, predatory lending, um, property value loss, and that's that's generational disadvantage, right? If you your parents buy a house but it becomes worthless, you you that's the head start that a lot of next generations get. You know they can have their home, will have a home, I can get a job or or whatever. But but the the communities of color don't have that that next generation that little bump in finances that little retirement nest egg that that people have because they were able to be financially more sound and so that leads the lack of those things lead to crime and health issues and foreclosures and, and vacancies and and the other things that you see there so the social and financial advancement in the U.S. again depended on these policy-driven dri racial segregation approaches. So where am I going with this? Well, all of these sort of prior mistreatments lay the groundwork for not trusting like the establishment, right? I don't trust the hospital system. I don't trust the government. I don't trust you know, uh, any sort of a thing, these things that, that have not been good to me. Um, I don't trust doctors. I don't trust, you know, so, so this, there's a history that sets up so like why with, with a lot of this history, some would think, why would you trust, you know, this if, if in, in this instance? So um, these things are impacting um, health. And so we see article after article talking about trust distrust and research uh, distrust in medical care and poor adherence so this low trust leads to poor adherence and so this low adherence is what's leading to now bad outcomes i mean people are avoiding the um the vaccine because they're they don't trust who made it. They don't trust uh, the, the process. They don't trust the provider. And so this is leading to a significant um, burden on these populations. And so, and medication non-adherence is the leading cause of inadequate hypertension management, which that of course makes sense. So let's look at some approaches to improving care. So my overall way of looking at the ways to improve care in, in African Americans and in other minority communities or disenfranchised communities is you have to first establish trust. You have to show them that you care and that you 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 care enough about about their their community that you have to learn about their community and the issues there and that you care enough to that you want to improve that. You have to sort of bone up on the genetic and epigenetic differences that 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 are just there. Um, you know, increased prevalence of hypertension, worsens cancer, you know, the, the dis disproportionately high prostate cancer. You have to kind of be aware of that and treat that community according to the specifics 
in their community rather than treating them for the, the specifics of another community, right? And you want to you want to have that the care you provide be based on evidence and research, you know, have it be scientific, right? So the key is improving uh, patient trust in the provider. You got to spend a little bit of extra time, kind of learn about these nuances, and be deliberate about you know how you how you deliver care. So the uh, American Heart Association did a great uh, sort of overview into cardiovascular health of African Americans back in 2017. And they, again, said, you know, the population-wide reductions, the, the successes that we've seen in cardiovascular disease have not been shared with the African-American community. And across almost any metric, African-Americans have poorer overall cardiovascular health than whites. How poor? Well, you see the increased risk for hypertension, coronary artery disease, twofold increased risk for heart failure, and three to four fold increased risk for stroke. So when you think about stroke, an African American at age 45 is over five times as likely to have an intracerebral hemorrhage. And when you think about that, I've seen patients again in 45, 55, sudden death, um, hypertension, poor control, cerebral hemorrhage. And, and many times, you know, with the death certificates, we would put myocardial infarction just because we don't know but a lot of those a lot of those deaths are cerebral hemorrhage so hypertension again the cause in 90 percent of those diabetes and smoking also major contributors so african americans are more than twice as likely to experience sudden cardiac death and just know that the rate of peripheral artery disease uh, is twice as high in African Americans compared to whites. And smoking is the, the big player in uh, peripheral artery disease, significant. African Americans who smoke are at twice at the risk of peripheral artery disease compared to age matched whites. Smoking was uh, directly linked to peripheral vascular disease and the, um, severity, the, the severity of your peripheral vascular disease is related to the amount of smoking. So, you know, in, in cases where we, you know, I, I never give my patients sort of a slide on the, you know, I decreased my smoking and I say, you've got to stop completely. But if someone goes from two packs a day to one pack a day, that's, they're going to cut their, their risk in half. They go from a pack a day to a half a pack a day, they're going to cut their, that risk in half. And so the, the burden of peripheral vascular disease is directly related to the number of cigarettes. So if they could get down to one or two cigarettes a day, that's a success. Now we all know when something goes wrong and some some stress in their life, they have a death in the family, that those that one to two cigarettes jumps back up to a pack a day again, and then they've, we've got increased issues. But just know that, that if you have someone with peripheral vascular disease and they smoke, you need to spend almost the entire visit talking about smoking cessation and, and letting them know that connection because really people don't don't connect you know pain in their feet issues in their legs with the fact that they're smoking that's just not a it's not a natural sort of connection so um, current smokers twice the risk of peripheral artery disease and they have they found that they have um <clears throat> excuse me eight times the likelihood <clears throat> of a high aortic calcium and so that's again that's 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 going to give them trouble down the road uh, so smoking diabetes and then high blood pressure are the biggest risk for peripheral artery disease in african americans um and then african americans were estimated to be at 77 percent higher risk for lower extremity amputation and so um, some of that is is you know not really looking into the options that are available some of it is not you know, being successful with stopping smoking related to, you know, menthol cigarettes and things that we won't really have time to talk about today. But um, but that increased amputation also may be related to increased inflammation from oppression and, and whatnot, but but much higher risk for amputation. So I frequently will talk link their smoking with uh, potential for amputation and that sometimes gets some people's attention. Um, just no hypertension is the, the biggest risk for cardiovascular health in, in, in African-Americans. And, um, but 
you know, on a positive note, African Americans tend to know they have high blood pressure uh, more so than whites, and they also tend to be treated more. But unfortunately, are less less likely to have their treatment uh, under control, right? They're much less likely to have, even they're they're more likely to be on medications, less likely to have their blood pressure the way it should be. And know that when you're bringing the blood pressure down, however much you bring it down, you're significantly improving their outcomes and, and, and more so than a matched person. So um, when you bring a, uh, an African-American's blood pressure down, you get three times the benefit than you would um, bringing a white person's blood pressure or a Spanish Latino person's blood pressure down. So um, being deliberate about that. So a 10 millimeter um, decrease in systolic blood pressure was associated with an 8% increase in risk in stroke in whites, but a 24% increase in risk in African Americans. And so when we looked at um, the, just how prevalent is, hi is hypertension um, in the African American community, it's significant. Um, we found that uh, uh, patients 55 and older, 75% uh, of black men and women, 75% uh, have uh, hypertension by the age of 55 compared to 55% uh, of white men and 40% um, of um, white female. Looking at this slide, we see that um, African American men, if you look at the orange uh, brown um, sort of um, top line there, that's African American men. If you look at age 30 uh, you'll see, and follow that up, you'll see 30% of African American men below, you know, between age 20 and 30 um, have hypertension. And so many of us will see, you know, a 28 year old African American male looking healthy and he'll come in and his blood pressure will be high. And I, you know, sometimes I attribute it to, you know, they're being aggravated with being the doctor or, or, you know, just stress or whatever. But in reality, they have hypertension. And we've been sweep, sweeping that sort of under the rug. Compare that to white women, for example, and look at look at that, how low that is compared to, you know, how low that number is. And it's looping up even at 40, you know, you're just about just about 10 percent at age 40 for for white women. But look at look at age 40 for um, black men. It's almost half. Right. So that's a, that's a significant increase in risk that we're sort of missing. So uh, their conclusion from that study is that, um, you know, we've got to be a little bit better about looking at, you know, being uh, identifying hypertension in those patients and also, um, you know, treating it. Um, know that, that, you know, some 20 year old information almost um, that, that thiazide diuretics and um, um, calcium channel blockers are the preferred treatment for hypertension in African Americans and not HACE inhibitors or beta blockers. That's not your first line African, um, first line hypertension treatment. You know, you get kidney disease, you've got CHF, then you got CAD, then all that stuff kicks in at that point. But if you're just treating hypertension in African Americans, uh, you wouldn't use a beta blocker, you wouldn't use an ACE inhibitor. Uh, as a first line, you would use calcium channel blockers and hydrochlorothiazide. And we just got studies that, that are old that show that that's, that's the case. ACE inhibitors just don't work as well. Beta blockers don't work as well with lowering the blood pressure. They do great with kidney protection. They do great with congestive heart failure. And, and certainly after someone's had a cardiac event, they're, they're all supposed to be on beta blockers. So don't get that, that part of it twisted. But just as, you know, someone was just, come, just coming in with hypertension, you don't want to put them on um, a toprolol or, 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 or lisinopril. And so given that sort of baseline, we, a study was done that looked at the prescribing patterns uh, for, for older uh, African Americans. And they found that, you know, sort of looking at this um, slide, so A, going down the vertical axis on the left-hand side, A is ACE inhibitors, B is beta blockers, C is calcium channel blockers, and D is diuretics, right? And so if you sort of follow across, you see that, um, you know, almost a third of, of African Americans are on ACE inhibitors for hypertension without diabetes, without chronic kidney disease. And so that's like the wrong thing. 
And so again, their conclusion from this study was treatment of hypertension appears to be inconsistent with prevailing treatment guidelines for nearly a third of African Americans. So that's the part where we come in as providers. What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Also of note, um, African Americans and Asian Pacific Islanders have a great, much greater increase of ACE-associated cough. And so I see that, I see that. I mean, I, a majority of my patients with hypertension, um, um, with, um, you know, CHF, or actually, rather, or diabetes, you know, when we put them on an ACE inhibitor for, for being, having diabetes, we find that they'll get a cough. And so I've got a majority of my African American patients are on ours because they, I put them on an ACE and they get a cough or they get, um, they get angioedema, which is also uh, increased in, in, in African Americans, much more prone to that. And so it's, it's at some point I'd love if the insurance companies would allow me to just put them on an ARV rather than worry about the, the um, putting them on an ACE and them getting a cough or having a, a you know, a near death experience. Um, but unfortunately, we have to follow the, those you know steps the way they're 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 written. But the, but if you see that in your practice, that's there's evidence to support that. Switching gears to the lipid profile, we find that African Americans have better lipid profiles. Their lipid profile is more favorable. They have a higher good cholesterol, higher HDL. They have a lower LDL, lower bad cholesterol, lower triglycerides, and that's just a population sort of outcomes. But unfortunately, those those sort of good lipid outcomes, uh, you know, sort of puts you like, oh, OK, well, they're 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 OK in terms of their cardiovascular risk because they're not. It actually under identifies their risk. And so the, those formulas that people use that in, incorporate a lipid profile in terms of getting their cardiovascular risk for African-Americans, they're under identifying that. Um, shifting to colon cancer, um, know that a colonoscopy is indicated at age 45 in African Americans due, due to earlier earlier onset of, of cancers and faster growing tumors, um, and that sigmoidoscopy is contraindicated due to the increased incidence of right-sided uh, polyps in African Americans. So I thought, wow, that's that's interesting. So, and this has been out again since 2005. That's when the American College of Gastroenterology said, you know, we really should be starting this um, cancer screening in African Americans at age 45, not 50. But when I again talk to my residents and say, you know, when does when does colon cancer screening start? And then they all say it's 50, 50, 50. Well, it's 45 if you have an African American population. If you look at um, this graph I showed you before, but I've highlighted the colon cancer sort of in an orange, and you see that in the African American population, much away from the pack. It's, um, so a significantly increased risk for death from, from um, colon cancer. And I thought it was um, interesting uh, that I got a letter, I was copied uh, from, from a patient who, who had a colonoscopy. And uh, as you can see, it says, uh, you note that you had nine polyps in the ascending and transverse colon, right? Nine polyps in the ascending and transverse colon. So if this person had had a sigmoidoscopy, um, they would have missed all nine polyps. So again, it's, it's scary. Um, and, um, and, and sigmoidoscopies are still being done, less than they used to, but they are unfortunately still being done. And when you look at um, the, um, you know, look at that, what's available in terms of um, um, screening uh, options um, nationally, um, again, flexible sigmoidoscopy is still an option for visual colon cancer screening. When people look at what are the recommendations, you know, from, from the preventative task force or whatever, what, what should you do? What's, what's an option to do? Uh, flexible sigmoidoscopy is still an option, but it's but it's it, you should know that it's not a good option for African Americans. Looking at prostate cancer again, we, we saw that significant difference: 19 per 100,000 in terms of mortality, 44 over twice um, for um, African Americans, and so this is what drives 
the um, the discussions about PSAs. You know, when they say uh, you know prostate cancers tends to be indolent, and we should be doing less uh, prostate-specific antigen testing. Um, that may be true for uh, white Americans and Asian and, and um, uh, Hispanic Latinos, but it's not true for African Americans. African Americans, a PSA is a better test in an African American. It detects cancer better, uh, detects it earlier, and so you should be doing uh, PSAs on your African American men because if they do get colon cancer, it's more aggressive and they die from it. I mean, so the old <clears throat> the old theory was that <clears throat> excuse me. The old theory was that if um, if you got prostate cancer, you, you know, you die of a heart attack because it was slow growing and 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 not a problem. And and we do see that. You know, they did autopsies and found in other populations that that people would die of a heart attack and they'd incidentally have you know early uh, prostate cancer. But that's not the case with African Americans. They have a much more aggressive cancer and the cancer metastasized sooner and causes a lot of uh, debility, uh, uh, suffering, and cost. So again, looking at the prostate cancer, I, I highlighted again, way away from the pack, African Americans, way away from the pack. And so these are people you need to be doing PSAs on um, annually, annual PSA, African American men, 40 and over. Looking at, um, a breast cancer, this is still one of the big um, sort of dichotomies in medicine is that the incidence of breast cancer is higher in white women, just a little bit higher, but it's higher. But um, unfortunately, the, um, the, the mortality is in African Americans is much, much higher. And so again, we see the breast cancer, you know, for something that occurs a little less in one community, why would there be a significantly higher um, uh, mortality? One of the reasons why is that the breast cancers that um, African American women get tend to have a lower frequency of hormone receptor positive tumors, and so, and they have that twofold a lower uh, survi survival. So the treatments that we have available for breast cancer um, are are not as um, good, basically for African Americans, and so that's why it's driving the worst outcomes. And so um, just know that, you know, when I talk about African-Americans, I'm, I know you can't, you can't, there's, a, you know, there are people, there are African-Americans that have just come from, from the Caribbean, from, from Asia, from Europe, um, and from Africa. And um, they are, uh, you know, the, there's a broad range of ancestry, right? And so I thought this was interesting that, that for example, it's been shown that only 34% of African-Americans have greater than 90% uh, West African ancestry. Only 30% have greater than 90% uh, you know, African ancestry, uh, opposed to 98% um, uh, of European or white Americans have greater than 90% uh, white ancestry. So and when you talk about um, you know, African Americans, you, you, can't, you can't just say this is all happening. These are just things to think about. And so I think back to when I was in medical school, we learned about Ashkenazi Jews. And, you know, Ashkenazi Jews had an increased risk for breast cancer and colon cancer and some other chromosomal issues. And we learned about them. And um, a couple of years back, I had a new patient and she said, I'm an Ashkenazi Jew. I was like, oh, my goodness, <clears throat> I've been waiting for you my whole career. And it's just to, just to bring it to the front of the brain. And so, and, and she was in her late fifties and she'd never had a mammogram and she'd never had a colonoscopy. So I ordered them and they were both normal, right? But it was just, I was trying to give the best care for her based on my knowledge. And so these are just some of the examples of, of what's available, the differences in the clinical care of African-Americans. So that when one's in front of you, if you have an African-American male in front of you, you know you got to think about prostate cancer. You got to check a PSA. You got to think about have they had a colon uh, colonoscopy, not a sigmoidoscopy. Just these little pearls to, to to improve your quality of care. So I appreciate the opportunity to present this year. I'm so happy to do it. There, there's tons more <laughs> that I could talk about, but at this point, um, I will take some questions. Thank you.